Um, so one of the biggest reasons I'm excited to talk to you today is because I know so many people are having to adjust a lot of their fundraising strategies that have historically worked for them very well and uh, adjust those to be digital, which can be kind of tough. Um, let me see. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can actually see what I'm talking about, which is going to be important because I have a lot of examples from real life nonprofits and how they've adjusted. Uh, to give you a little bit of background on who I am and why I'm talking to you, uh, I am part of the team over at QGIF. We are an online fundraising platform. Uh, we work with thousands of nonprofits all over the U.S. and up into Canada, and we uh, do everything we can to facilitate their online fundraising. So that's really what we focus on. Um, at one point, I had my chat. There we go. Uh, so I wanted to ask you all now if you could type yes into the chat box if you are actually working on uh, running digital fundraising events for the end of the year. Is that something you're working on? Awesome. Okay, cool. You guys, someone said overtry. Oh, <laughs> I feel you there. It is hard to adjust. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you today is about the best practices and some examples of online fundraising. Uh, and I wanted to let you guys know that I'm coming to this topic both as someone who works for an online fundraising platform, but also as someone who does this in my real life. Uh, I'm on a board here in town and a part of my job for them on this board is to help move them into digital fundraising. So I'm showing these examples to you to hopefully inspire you, but I'm also showing them to you because uh, it's, these are actually things that we can execute, you and I. So the way I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna start with small ideas that you can do without investing much extra time or money, and then I'm gonna move into bigger and more time intensive uh, topics. For each uh, event I'm gonna show you, I will also give you a takeaway for some things that you can try applying to your own campaigns. Um, so maybe you might not be able to execute exactly the same fundraising strategy, but you can certainly take something away from it. So the one I'm gonna start with is probably the most basic. You don't need to have any extra staff. This won't take a ton of extra budget. And uh, this comes from our friend at the Downtown Women's Center. So as you see Holly's feedback and everyone else that I'm talking to you about today, all of these are real nonprofits who work with QGIF and we ask them how they were adjusting to fundraising during this very weird time in history. Uh, and the biggest thing that a lot of people focused on, including Holly, is building a human connection with the people that have supported them in the past. So Holly told us that the folks over at the Downtown Women's Center were intentionally reaching out to every donor that they had in their database. Uh, they reached out to around 2,000 of them, and they reached out to them just to check up on them and see how they were doing. Uh, and I can hear a lot of you thinking, that's a lot of time. Uh, so don't feel like you need to call every single donor in your database. What I would encourage you to do is to reach out to your donors, maybe who have uh, given regularly to you for years and years, or who are major donors, or who have a close working relationship with your organization. In this instance, you don't have to worry about actually asking for money. You can just ask them to see how they're doing. Uh, for Holly and her team, those calls did result in some gifts, but the most important thing they did was they warmed up these relationships before they sent out their May appeal. <clears throat> so this is a low cost, high impact activity, uh, and this is actually something that is really timely since we're about to move into the year in fundraising season. Calling your donors just to check on them may result in some gifts, but it will almost undoubtedly result in higher donor engagement later in the year when you're actually ready to ask. So a single takeaway here is that we understand that donors are motivated by understanding their impact and by connecting with real people that are passionate about the same things they are. So you can call uh, your donors and just ask them how they're doing. That's that, that's that relationship piece. The other thing you can do is tell them how their money has made a difference in the past to give them a little bit of an update about what you've been doing with the money they've given you before, and they will be more likely to give to you again in the future. 
Um, and the, just to reiterate, this is a great, great, great activity before you're in fundraising. Uh, if you've ever had a friend that calls you only when they want something and it starts to get on your nerves, uh, you can you can do this activity and not be that person. Uh, you can build a relationship here without asking. Uh, the second idea that a lot of people brought to us was that they launched an emergency fundraising appeal. And I feel like I can hear you rolling your eyes because of course people are gonna launch emergency fundraising appeals. But what is really beautiful is about the way they launch these emergency fundraising appeals. Um, another thing I'm gonna ask you to type yes into uh, if you would let me know, yes or no, if you have gotten any pushback from your board or your leadership about fundraising during a pandemic, uh, let me know if that's been a problem for you. Oh, a lot of no's. That's really good. I'm really happy to hear that because uh, from a lot of people, there is a couple of yeses in there. I have heard a lot that boards and uh, leaders are really afraid to ask for money during times of upheaval. And Lord knows 2020 has been a time of upheaval. So I'm really glad that's not, a, not an issue for you folks. So one thing that was just really beautiful is this campaign from the Humane Society of the Pikes Peak region. They launched an emergency fundraising campaign. Uh, they did it primarily online through email. And then they did a lot of asking on Facebook. And they brought in around $60,000. Uh, but the thing that I think is most interesting is, uh, aside from asking for direct mail uh, appeals or sending direct mail appeals and asking people individually for donations, they ask on Facebook every week. And I know that a lot of us are worried about donor fatigue and we worry about people uh, thinking that we're asking for money too frequently. So what they did to kind of mitigate that is they updated at least as frequently as they ask for support. So that is something that you can, you can take away from this campaign and apply to your own. They were very specific about what they needed uh, and they updated very frequently. So donors were always up to date on what was going on. Uh, donors are proving over and over again that they are willing to support people, but you know how crowded your newsfeed is, you know how crowded your inbox is, your donors are the same way. So asking frequently and updating even more is a great way to make an impression upon your donors. Uh, this is actually a local church here in my hometown that set up a COVID-19 relief fund and then launched an appeal specifically for the fund. Uh, they gave a lot of different avenues for people to donate. So they asked on Facebook, they let people donate by text. Of course, they asked um, during their church services that were all streaming online. But a big thing that you can take away here is that if you're facing new needs that are being highlighted by anything. Uh, so in 2020, we've had, of course, the pandemic, but based on where you are in the country, you may be facing um, new shortfalls or new demands because of natural disasters or political happenings or budgetary changes in your city. You, you could be facing lots of different obstacles. So try setting up an emergency appeal for a specific fund. Now I will caution you here, if you are setting up a specific fund, you need to be kind of careful with how you handle this. Uh, you need to be really explicit about where and how that money is spent because your donors are giving to this fund with the expectation that it's being spent a certain way. So uh, try setting up a very specific campaign to support a specific program and then be very intentional about updating your donors on how that money is used. This was one of my favorite events that we saw because I love a good pun very much. Uh, so this group saw a huge downturn in the amount of money that was coming into their doors because they are a nonprofit bike shop. Uh, they noticed that the flatten the curve measures that were very important for keeping COVID-19 under control was also flattening their revenue. So they launched their fix a flat program and asked people to help meet that gap in funding that resulted when the shop had to shut down. So if you are looking for a way to stand out because we're about to get into a very busy fundraising season, 
look and see how you can frame your appeals in a creative way to catch donors' attention. Um, helping your donors see how your need is related to the situation at hand, whether it's a pandemic or a natural disaster or something else, is really effective. Um, what can you do to show donors the correlation between what's happening and the needs that you have, and then how can they help solve that problem? Um, something even as simple as a pun, like fix a flat, can be really very effective. So get a little creative with your wordplay and see how that goes over. This is a really sweet campaign that came from our friends over at Urban Promise Charlotte. Uh, this one was actually one where all the employees at QGive in our like Slack channel, we were all just hitting F5 on their fundraising page because it was such a beautiful thing to watch. So Urban Promise Charlotte works with um, students and families that need a little extra financial help sometimes. And they launched what they called the Family Stability Fund to help people who are facing extra financial need. Their goal was to raise $3,500 so they could send a $10 Walmart gift card to every family they worked with. They were very specific with their donors, asked for help, and the donations poured in, y'all. They raised over $35,000 uh, in the space of 24 hours. So what they've done is they sent regular updates and it's the same thing that's important with that Humane Society, the regular updates are really important. They let people know uh, why that money was so important and what it was going to do. And they were openly emotional and, and thankful to their donors for all the support that they had. So when you're creating and sending your appeals, don't be afraid to be vulnerable with your donors. This group was unabashedly emotional about everything that was happening. They were so thankful and they used language that showed that thankfulness. Um, you don't have to temper your emotions right now. Uh, this is an emotional time to be alive and people have a lot of feelings and it now isn't the time to kind of hide your appeal behind really polite, formal language. Now's the time to be real with your donors. So when you create your appeals for the end of the year or for an emergency appeal, stay authentic and transparent with your donors. Encourage people to uh, keep an eye on you and stay updated with how they're using their money and reiterate how thankful you are for their support. So if you decide to launch an emergency appeal, uh, here are some ideas. You can also apply these ideas to your regular year end appeal, especially if you're having to adjust that at all because of current situations. So we know that donors want to help. Uh, they wouldn't be donating to you at all if they didn't want to help. So as you're sending out these appeals, do try to segment your appeals. Uh, if you have had someone who has donated to you faithfully all year, you may want to thank them specifically for their support during a really trying time. Uh, if you are talking to a major donor, you're not gonna wanna talk to them the same as you would to someone who gave you $30 back in April. Uh, and then if you're worried about asking too frequently, you should try updating at least as frequently as you ask. Someone asked if there is a minimum, a minimum number of times you should be asking and that answer is really going to vary from nonprofit to nonprofit. Uh, and it will also kind of vary from channel to channel. So if you're sending direct mail appeals, you're not going to want to send an appeal a week. That is exhausting and expensive. Uh, you may want to send those two, four, two to four times a year. If you're asking on Facebook, you can ask much more frequently because you know that not every donor is going to see every Facebook post that you make. So experiment. And then if you are kind of in doubt, look to what others are doing who are fundraising in your space and ask your donors. Ask that loyal donor that you know will be honest with you, like, am I asking too infrequently or uh, am I too asking too much? Uh, and then if you get a little creative and put a different spin on your fundraising piece, you can ask a little more frequently because people are going to enjoy engaging with you. And then do offer several giving avenues. Uh, offer online giving and direct mail at least, and then maybe experiment with, with other uh, fundraising options. 
Uh, would you type yes or no in the chat box and let me know if you rely on in-kind donations very frequently? Uh, I know the organization I work with doesn't really rely on in-kind donations. I know others like SPCAs and shelters do. Okay, there's a really good mix. So I'm going to, I'm going to dig into this a little bit, um, mostly because they're kind of cool. So for those of you who do rely on in-kind donations, um, I know one obstacle that a lot of us have had to kind of work around is uh, actually getting things safely because of all of the social distancing requirements and the shipping delays and all the things. Um, so if you depend upon in-kind donations, try setting up an Amazon wish list. This can be a really fun way to take in-kind donations. It's safe for you, it's safe for your donors, and it also scratches that online shopping itch that so many of us have developed as we are home more and more. I don't know about you guys, but I have found myself buying some ridiculous items online, especially on Amazon, like at 1130 when I'm bored. And setting up an Amazon wish list is a way to engage with your donors when they're already doing something that they are used to doing. Your donors are already shopping online. Give them the opportunity to support you while they're engaging with that online shopping. Uh, when you ask for in-kind donations, of course, you want to be really specific about what you need, which is another reason I kind of like the idea of an online wish list. Um, I have some friends who work with the SPCA and they have received some outrageous items that they would never be able to use. So be specific when you ask for your in-kind donations so you don't get something dumb that you would never use. Uh, if you notice here, the, this emergency shelter was asking for very specific things. I love how, how specific they are. They even broke it down to different uh, facilities to indicate what they needed. They also did have, uh, in this instance, a drop-off, an in-person drop-off. So they were very specific with donors to let donors know exactly what to expect when they were dropping things off and how to do it safely. So if you decide to go with in-kind donations in person, that's really important. We know that donors like to know what to expect. They wanna know what they're getting into and the more at ease you can put people uh, when it comes to donating in person, the more likely they are to do so. So if you're putting together an appeal for in-kind donations, try to be as specific as possible asking. I included this screenshot of Hope Center who also had an Amazon wish list signed up. You notice that they included that in the screenshot. Uh, but they, they said very specifically, we need underwear. We need underwear all the time and no one really donates it. So please help us out. And they got what they needed. So they were specific, they had an Amazon wish list, and they explained what they needed and why they needed it, which is really important, especially if you're asking for something that's a little off the wall. Um, if you're an animal shelter and you're asking for dogs, like dog food, people will understand why you need dog food without you really telling them. But if you're asking for underwear, it might be a little bit of a different story. As an English nerd and enthusiastic writer, this is probably one of my favorite sections because it is all about how to appeal to your donors simply by switching up the language. So our friends over at Pet Alliance of Greater Orlando, which is an absolutely wonderful organization, noticed that a lot of the people they were asking for support from uh, were struggling with the economy. So what they did is they decided to emphasize if you are able to give. They wanted to stay humble and be helpful, but they also wanted to let people know that it was okay if they didn't have the financial ability to support them at this time. So <clears throat> this is kind of a great way to appeal, um, especially if you are appealing frequently as the Pet Alliance of Greater Orlando was, to kind of soften that ask a little bit uh, and let people know that you are, you need their help, but it's okay if they can't give to you right away. Um, a lot of you did say that you were not really having to struggle with pushback from your organization uh, when it comes to fundraising, which is great. Uh, so you don't have to worry about this next thing, but this is a useful way to kind of compromise with leaders who are a little leery about fundraising uh, during a particular time. This is so short and so sweet and I love it. Our friends over at Brother Wolf Animal Rescue 
told us that they changed their communications to be 90% positive to help people engage with them. Uh, I don't know about you, but I am emotionally exhausted every time I read the news. And um, it's just, it's a tough time right now. So what they did is they switched to using positive language. So in the past, they used to have all kinds of stories about um, abandoned animals that needed medical attention or um, showing pictures of surgery, because that's something that they do a lot of here. But they switched to showing a lot of success stories, a lot of adoption stories, a lot of very hopeful stories. And this is a perfect uh, tip for some of you, especially if you're starting to see your open rates go down uh, in your email. Uh, I will admit that I'm a donor to this organization and I actively look forward to their emails when I get them. Uh, I get appeals from all kinds of nonprofit organizations, but I always open the emails from Brother Wolf because I know it will be a bright spot in my day. So if you are looking for ways to engage your donors, try switching your focus to focusing on success stories and kind of feel good information because donors are looking for feel good information. Uh, this is a great example from Pickens County Habitat for Humanity. They really focused on one big thing. They focused on the fact that despite the virus and despite, uh, I don't remember where Pickens County is located, but I think they just had a big storm or a fire near them. Despite all of the obstacles that they have been working around this year, they said to all of their donors that this need existed before 2020 and this need will exist after 2020. Uh, so many organizations have told me that they feel like their mission is not as important now as it used to be, particularly those people who are in the arts um, or are in an industry that's not really focused on the front lines of political fundraising or uh, COVID-related fundraising. But your need is important and your need existed before 2020 and it will continue to exist and your donors loved you in the past and they supported your mission in the past. Show them that they can still continue to support your mission today. You don't have to rely on jargon or catchphrases. Um, you can always talk about how whatever is going on in your area is highlighting the needs that you have. But remember, donors supported you in the past because your mission is important to them. And focusing on those missions continuously will engage them and inspire them to continue to support you. Uh, so I know that, I, I mean, I have started to see it taper off. I know a lot of people at the beginning of the pandemic were kind of making fun of the now more than ever uh, phrases or the in these uncertain time phrases. So I have seen that taper off, which makes me really happy. But I did just want to reiterate that if you are referencing the pandemic or other current events in your appeals, you be transparent and authentic. And when I say transparent and authentic, I mostly mean stick away from or stay away from um, buzzwords or, or over repetitive language that gets used a lot because you, you don't want your donors to think that you're kind of automating or mindlessly sending out these appeals. Talk about your mission and talk candidly about how your ability to work toward that mission is being affected by current events uh, and just be honest with your donors about what's going on and how they can help. This is a fun one. Uh, so send your donors something fun to do. I don't know where you all are located. I'm in Florida and we uh, were in lockdown all of April and many of us are still having to stay home a lot. And I'm sure many of you are facing similar uh, challenges. So a challenge when that is happening is staying top of mind with your donors, especially if you are used to having spring and summer fundraising events. And now as we move into the winter months, if you are accustomed to having fall and winter fundraising events. So what you can do instead is to stay at the top of their minds by sending them a fun activity. Um, this isn't necessarily something that you would want to use as a standalone fundraising like strategy, you would want to combine this with something else. But you can try doing something like Police Land Trust did here. 
uh, they wanted to engage their donors without their regular in-person events. So they sent out this wildflower bingo and they encouraged people to go hike around the land that's in the land trust and look for these, these flowers and then engage with them when they got back and letting them share pictures and share stories and then turn in their bingo cards. Uh, this was also really cool because there were prizes associated with getting a bingo. Uh, they got gift cards from some of the local businesses that had always sponsored their events in the past. So they were continuing to support and highlight their corporate partners and their business partners, but they were also giving their donors something fun and engaging to do that was related to their mission. Um, if you are looking for a way to engage your donors, or if you're looking for a way to kind of zhuzh up a virtual event that you have going on, or even if you just kind of want to build some goodwill in your community, this is a really fun way to do that. Um, doing something like this, very similar to calling your donors, is a great move if you want to engage your donors now before you lead up to your year-end ask. So you can totally try something like this. Uh, if you offer any programming to kids, there are lots of opportunities to engage with them here. Um, in this instance, Junior Achievement knew that kids over the summer were stuck at home and were kind of bored and they couldn't do all of the fun JA activities that they were used to doing. So they gave parents and then later their teachers free access to all of the remote learning resources they had available. Uh, so if you, especially if you have children programming, but this can work really for anything, um, you, by providing this information to them for free, you can still kind of give them something of value, which is really important. And it's a great way to just stay on your supporters radars, especially as we navigate this year and go into the end of the year fundraising period. So we've been cooped up for a while. I don't know about you guys. I am still spending way more time at home than I would love to do. Uh, and I know that a lot of parents are very much in the same situation. So you can try engaging your donors, especially families, but really anybody by giving them something fun to do. This could be something as simple as a scavenger hunt, like that bingo card, or sending fun activities that people can share online. I've seen lots of nonprofits do coloring pages for their, for their families. Um, and just getting creative, flexing those creative muscles and providing activities to your donors that they can do, especially to keep them uh, engaged with you before you make an appeal. This is just kind of a, a mishmash of fun activities that others have tried that I think might inspire a few of you. Um, this one is from a local organization that is near and dear to my heart. I have uh, watched this nonprofit thrive during some very difficult situations because they are a, a health clinic. So one of the big obstacles they had was having to put some social distancing measures in place that really harmed their ability to provide some services because they're entirely volunteer run. So what they did is they put together the Be a Helper push. Uh, they gave in this push people lots of different opportunities to support them in lots of different ways, both financial and non-financial. So financial ways you could support them was obviously donating or you could buy your uh, the staff for that day lunch or send them snacks or coffee. And they also ask for, for totally free things or nearly free if you count stamps. They asked for letters of encouragement for the staff because the staff was tired and they were working in a health clinic during a pandemic. It's very stressful. So look around at your needs, uh, financial and non-financial, and see if you can come up with a way for donors to meet those needs. Um, do you need encouragement? Do you need lunches? Do you need boxes of crayons? Do you need um, people to give rides to your staff? Just look around and see what opportunities there are for your donors to support you. You have a lot of opportunities to get creative right now and donors are willing to step up, we just have to ask them. This was another really cool opportunity for, uh, especially for nonprofits like some of you who are still trying to figure out if you're going to do your fall and winter fundraisers. Can you guys let me know if you're planning on doing an in-person fundraiser this year? Um, that will help me kind of determine how I'm gonna approach this with you. So uh, a lot of you, like, 
So if you are like many organizations, if you regularly have a year end fundraiser, uh, you probably have corporate sponsors who sponsor that that fundraiser every year. In this instance, our friends at the Habitat for Humanity had already planned their event. Uh, this was right when everything got kind of wild back in March and April. They had to cancel that event and they already had sponsors lined up. So what they did was they approached their sponsors and said, hey, we can't have our in-person event that you've already paid to sponsor. Would you be willing to consider that sponsorship a tax deductible gift? Uh, all of their sponsors agreed and said yes. And then they used that money to springboard themselves into a matching gift fundraiser. So if you are, if you have decided, like many of you indicated, you've decided not to pursue an in-person in event, or if you are not sure yet, like Jennifer um, and a couple of other people, and you have those kind of existing sponsorship relationships, approach your sponsors and say, hey, you have loyally supported this event every year. Uh, we're not able to have our traditional year-end fundraising event. Would you be willing to consider making a donation instead? And then using that money to kind of launch yourself into a different kind of fundraiser. Um, as time has gone on, we've heard a lot of other people who have done the same strategy or taken the same approach, and it has worked for, for many of them. Uh, this is a really great example of two nonprofits that had problems and found a way to turn their problems into a fundraising opportunity. Um, so what the kind of the too long didn't read version of this is Hope Center is a shelter that usually sleeps around 650 people. When they enacted social distancing precautions, they weren't able to sleep nearly as many. Uh, Transylvania University, on the other hand, had lots of space that was being unused because they couldn't have events. So they teamed up and Hope Center started sleeping their, um, their clients at Transylvania University. The partnership blew up. It made lots of news. Um, it was two nonprofits cooperating with each other, solving each other's problems, and it attracted news and donations, which was really great. So you may not be able to pull off this exact arrangement. It would be kind of uncanny if you did. But this is a great example of how teaming up with other nonprofits can be good for everyone involved. Uh, I know it can feel like nonprofits are often competing for the same money, especially if you live in a small town like I do. Uh, but partnerships between nonprofits can really be kind of a win-win for everyone involved. So look around and see if you can solve a problem for another nonprofit, see if another nonprofit can solve a problem for you, and team up and see if you can get some, some attention around that campaign. So the takeaway with these kind of one-off ideas is really that every nonprofit is unique. You have a different challenge, a different group of corporate donors, a different donor base, and different opportunities than any other nonprofit on the planet. So what can you do to raise money, stay visible in your community, and then help the people that you have been serving for years already? Um, try asking your event sponsors to consider their sponsorships as regular donations and use that money to kind of launch a new fund or to springboard yourself into a new fundraising campaign. Partner up with your local businesses or other nonprofits. And then if you have needs uh, that you can engage donors to, to kind of meet, ask donors to get involved, ask for notes of encouragement, ask for someone to send you lunch. Uh, you'll never know until you ask. Uh, these methods require a little more creativity one of them is to embrace Zoom, which I feel like we're all doing because we are all currently on Zoom. Uh, if you remember me talking to you about Urban Promise Charlotte, that group that raised $35,000 in a couple of days, they were looking for a way to engage all of their new donors by connecting with them on Zoom. But they did something that I've never seen another nonprofit do before, and they invited their own clients to those meetings as well. They started calling these meetings family meetings, and they were short 45 minute get togethers with a small group of donors, a staff member from the nonprofit themselves, and then a former client. So this gave nonprofit donors an opportunity to connect with each other, and it also gave them the opportunity to talk to someone who is actually positively impacted by their gift. This went over really well. Uh, so look and see if that's something that you can do. 
uh, especially if you have a group of engaged donors and a group of engaged clients, this could be a really valuable opportunity to show donors their impact in real life. Uh, this was adorable. If any of you do children's programming, uh, this group in my hometown of Lakeland, Florida, had to shut down and cancel their uh, spring camp and their summer camps. What they did instead is they had all of these camp meetings over Zoom. So kids and families built campsites in their living room. They all got together on Zoom and they sang songs and they played bingo and it was a huge success. So get creative with your formatting. If you have any kind of programming that you can move online, uh, you may be able to, with a little bit of creativity and some prep work, make it really successful as a virtual event. Uh, this group did something very similar. This is a Girl Scout group. Uh, Mountains to Midlands is actually made up of lots of smaller troops. What they did is they used streaming video. They didn't use Zoom, they used Facebook Live uh, to put together virtual mega troops where girls could tune in and watch and engage with someone leading them through the activities that they would typically do uh, in person at a Girl Scout meeting. So in this one, uh, they were actually, I think they were making it solar oven. So this is just another good example of how with a little bit of creativity, uh, you can move some of your programming online. You don't need fancy tech. You can't really tell from the screenshot, but they did everything just with their phones and it, it went beautifully. If you are an arts organization or an organization that focuses on uh, memberships or sponsorships, this could be inspiring to you. This group, Rock by the Sea, had already set up a music festival. People had already bought their backstage passes, uh, and then they had to cancel everything. So what they did instead is they gave all of their backstage pass holders invitations to a virtual backstage brunch, uh, and those people got to have a virtual brunch with the musicians that they would otherwise be meeting backstage. Um, in this case, this is a music festival. I've also seen this work really well with uh, a local museum who had that problem. A lot of people had paid for memberships. They didn't get to go to all of the gallery openings that are typically included in those memberships. So what they did instead is they had exclusive talks and lectures with the museum curator uh, that they could be invited to. So more great examples of people moving their programming online. Um, Zoom and GoToWebinar and Facebook Live and YouTube Live and Instagram Live, because every platform does live now, uh, they are a really great tool still. Uh, try moving your programming online, even if it requires a little bit of tweaking to kind of get the format right. Uh, it's totally uh, possible and people are getting really good at it. Everyone is now accustomed to using Zoom. <laughs> Uh, create special meetings, whether on Zoom or through another platform for donors and give them the opportunity to connect with you uh, on a small one-on-one -on -one level or in groups of maybe three or four. They would love getting to know each other. They love getting to know you. You get to connect with your donors in a meaningful way and you get to keep them connected to your mission, which is really important. Um, you can also try running something like a telethon, which I'm seeing uh, more and more people do. This group here is a local nonprofit that ran the toilet paper telethon when we couldn't find toilet paper anywhere. And it was really, it was a series of streamed performances from different musical artists kind of interspersed with fundraising appeals and it, it worked really well. I'm gonna show you some creative ideas. Create is the keyword here because people uh, started producing goods to kind of help meet budget shortfalls. Um, in one instance, there was a talented board member that was really great on a sewing machine. She started making masks for people and selling them, and then all of the money that she raised went to the organization. So you may not have a whiz board member, but you could have someone with a cool uh, talent or a cool side business that you could use to kind of raise some money. Um, Megan Mathis at Rise Up Malawi got engaged with, I keep saying engaged, uh, she got involved with a group um, of donors who were looking for a tangible item by creating a t-shirt campaign with Bonfire. 
Um, I will say I'm not affiliated with Bonfire at all. I'm not partners with them, but they're a really cool company. I have bought several shirts from different fundraisers on Bonfire. Um, take a look and see if it's an option for you. It may not be, and that's fine. You don't have to, to do everything that I'm showing you in this webinar, but if you're looking for ways to raise a little extra money, try doing a t-shirt campaign. Um, if you don't know where to begin on a t-shirt campaign, or if you are trying to decide if you even want to try a t-shirt campaign or masks or something like that, ask your donors. Um, ask if they would be interested in buying a shirt. Maybe run a contest and see if someone can design a shirt for you and the winner gets a free shirt. Um, lots of opportunities to, to have fun here. This is another niche idea that could inspire you. Um, the group over at Mary Shelter Gulf Coast faced a problem where the residents at the shelter weren't able to work because everything was locked down. Uh, so they started making homemade home decor that was sold over the internet and then in local stores when the stores opened. You may not have a group of women who have a real knack for creating glitter magnets, but you probably do have some talented individuals on your board or in your donor base what talents do they have and would they be willing to donate to you uh, that could help you raise some money? Just a, an interesting thing. You could try polling your audiences. You can try reaching out individually to board members or donors that you know have a particular talent and asking them to donate. Um, just This is just another idea. Uh, this is yet another niche idea that could spark some, uh, some inspiration in you. This group is a nonprofit news source. They found that many of their sponsors that traditionally bought paid advertising space were pulling back because their budgets had changed. What they did instead is they donated that ad space to local nonprofits. Uh, so they didn't really use this as a revenue generator, but it was, was a great example of nonprofits supporting each other. Um, this was a huge boost to local nonprofits that really needed the revenue. And then it made this nonprofit, Lakeland Now, look really good in the community um, because donors and sponsors who were eventually going to pay for ad space again knew that they were supporting a good organization. So you may be able to do something similar to this. Um, I included this screenshot. It's not a Kegel client, but this is one of my absolute favorite fundraisers I've ever seen. Uh, and this is just an example that fundraisers don't have to be perfect. They can be just fun. Uh, an animal shelter, I think up in Minnesota, launched a campaign where for $15, a, a volunteer would send you, the donor, a pet portrait. Uh, it may be great. It may be terrible. It may be hilarious like these up here. Um, they eventually had so many $15 donations and requests for portraits that they actually had to shut down the campaign because it was so popular. So look, look at what you have. What makes your organization unique? Can you channel that into something that's really cool that would get people excited and kind of make you stick out? Um, is there an opportunity for you to sell campaign merchandise? Is there an opportunity for you to kind of work with artists to raise money and hopefully raise some money for the artist too? Can you donate any services or materials to other nonprofits? Uh, look around. There's There are a lot of people who are being really creative and trying new things during this particular year, and it's a great time to do it. These next few things that I'm going to show you are big, bad, awesome events that do require a little bit of extra planning, but have worked very well for some clients. Um, so you could do what many people are doing. You could start from scratch and create a brand new event. Uh, this one is super fun. This was a virtual event that was put together by the Pierce Family Foundation. And the way they handled it was they had an $18 entry fee. So someone went and bought a ticket online and in their registration confirmation, they received a special link to a Zoom meeting. And in that meeting, they had cocktail making classes, they had dance classes, and they had an online raffle. Uh, they, did, they did tell me that this is called Backyard Burlesque, but it was good for families. Uh, but think, could you do something similar? Could you kind of switch your regular year and fundraising event to a virtual event? People could still buy a ticket. They could get a Zoom link. They could see all of your live entertainment. We've seen people do keynote speeches uh, and really just run a traditional fundraising event with all of the traditional programming online. 
uh, we have seen a lot of nonprofits get very creative with some peer to peer fundraising ideas. This is one of those examples. Uh, the folks over at Save a Life work with uh, work to raise awareness around hemophilia and other blood disorders. What they did after they had to cancel their primary fundraising event for the year was they hosted the virtual at home Mount Everest challenge. Uh, this was timed to um, commemorate the first Mount Everest summit by a hemophilia patient. Uh, and what they did was they asked people to donate $29 and then do 29 of something. So walk 2.9 miles, climb 29 flights of stairs like this guy did holding his dog, uh, swim 29 laps, you, you get the idea. And then they were to challenge someone else to participate very much like the ice bucket challenge. Um, this worked beautifully. They had raised, just when we talked to them, they had just started it. They had raised a little over $1,000 just in that week. They had a match lined up, so that money went even further. Uh, could you do something similar? Could you go with something like this, which is more simple? It doesn't require as much work on your, your part. Uh, could you take it a step further and do a full-blown peer-to-peer event? Uh, you could do one or both. Uh, speaking of peer-to-peer -peer events, our friends at uh, Campfire of Central Florida did a really fun peer-to-peer -peer event. So as a little bit of background, this group always had a Kentucky Derby party that was always on May 5th. And of course, it didn't happen this year. And that event in our little small town is one of the big events on the calendar for this town. People really look forward to it. So what they did to keep people engaged with that and to keep them kind of psyched up about it is they sold these little mint julep baskets uh, and a board member would deliver the basket. What was really fun is they had their board members set up a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising page. Each of them had their own. They each appealed for donations and there was a prize for the person who collected the most money online. Uh, that board member had to dress up like a horse and race up and down South Florida Avenue, which is the main drag through through Lakeland. So I would be lying if I said I didn't donate to someone because I wanted to see them dress up in a horse mask. Uh, the event was really fun. It got a lot of people engaged. It raised a fair amount of money. It was really silly and it was a moment of levity uh, during a, a weird time of the fundraising year. Uh, so look around and see if you can get your board members involved in fundraising. I know a common complaint with nonprofits is that board members are not especially engaged in the fundraising process. <laughs> you might be able to attest to that. Uh, giving them a virtual peer-to-peer -peer fundraising page is a really great way for them to kind of advocate on your behalf and raise money for you without the fear that comes with sitting down and doing face-to-face -face asks. Uh, this is another cool example of a nonprofit that saw a couple of needs and stepped in to turn the solution into a revenue generator. Uh, you may not be able to do something exactly like this, but what they did here is they noticed there were two problems in their community. There was a large group of people that needed food because they had lost their jobs or were furloughed, and they had a large group of businesses, restaurants in particular, that were struggling because of the economic situation in the lockdown. So what they did was they took a lot of donations and raised money to buy meals at cost from the restaurants. So they helped keep restaurants active and then they donated and delivered those meals to people who needed food. Uh, they managed to receive or to generate some revenue doing this because they did receive a portion of the donations that to kind of cover the administrative costs of arranging the food and then dropping it off. So think outside the box and see if you can come up with some cool ideas to meet needs while generating some revenue. Uh, if you have the time and resources, and I want to reiterate that because you all lead uh, a very busy life and you have really important jobs and your mental and physical well-being are important. If you have the time and the energy, try creating a different event. Um, build something interactive that donors can have fun with support local businesses when you can, and then just focus on having fun with your donors. I'm going to quickly move through some of these. Um, I'm sure all nonprofit fundraisers are sick and tired of the word pivot, but I'm going to use it one more time. Uh, we're going to pivot some events that you're already planning and turning them into digital fundraisers. This is a really interesting uh, 
really interesting plan. They, they had two obstacles. So one, this group had to cancel an event that they always ran. It was an annual thing. Everyone looked forward to it. It's based on the National College Athletic Association tournament, which wasn't happening because of COVID. At the same time, their seamstresses in Cambodia, who depend upon their business to earn a living wage, weren't able to keep working because the shutdowns had limited their access to the materials they needed for their sewing. So they combined these two programs and they ended up raising just over $76,000. So what they did was they asked people to make a $5 gift. The $5 gift bought five masks and a week of meals for students. And the masks were sewn by the seamstresses in Cambodia. So they didn't lose their jobs. They still earned a living wage. Masks were being distributed and people funneled the money that they would usually give to the NCAA tournament to, to this campaign. Um, this is another fun idea for pivoting. So uh, JA runs a bowlathon every year. This year they couldn't actually have the in-person bowling. So what they did instead was they had their traditional peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser that they do every year. Uh, but at the end, it culminated in a virtual trivia challenge where they did trivia over Zoom. Uh, it ended up being so popular that they actually continued doing Zoom trivia, which was really fun. They had themes and all kinds of uh, cool ideas, and it was a huge hit with their supporters. Um, they also did move some other programming online, programming that they did every year. Uh, so this is just another great opportunity, or a great example of a nonprofit who took an opportunity to move things online and saw some success. So some takeaways here. Is there a way for you to translate what has worked for you in the past and translate it to digital? Um, donors know that people are having to adjust. The whole world is having to adjust. They're being very gracious with us right now. So if you can, try switching up events that you have always run and that your donors are used to supporting and doing them online. Uh, this example here is from, it's just a screenshot of a video from our friends over at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Southern Minnesota and talk about a graceful group of donors. Uh, they had in 24 hours, they had to alert everyone that their, uh, that their fundraising auction was being moved to digital and they killed it. They did such a great job. Donors came through, they surpassed their fundraising goal and it went beautifully. Look and see if any of your needs can be combined and used as a fundraising opportunity. And then if you're totally stuck and you don't know where to start, sit down with your boards, board members, with your staff, and even with volunteers and donors and see if you can crowdsource some ideas. You will be amazed at what people will come up with. Now, I just covered a lot of information in this webinar. Uh, so if you have any questions, let me know. I also do want to be respectful of your time. So if you don't have any questions, uh, I won't take it personally, but uh, just let me know. Clay, do we have any questions? Uh, there was, uh, we had one question, uh, but I think you kind of answered it. It was, uh, you know, how often is it is too often to ask? Yeah. Going back to the donations. So you talked about that a little bit, I think. And is yeah. There a so. The one thing that I just want to reassure you all about, because I hear this a lot, um, there, everyone is looking for the perfect sweet number that will work every time. And there, there really isn't a perfect number. The idea is to experiment and, and instead of just asking your donors for support, ask them for feedback too. Um, so I did a, at the beginning of this year, which feels like an eternity ago, I did a a research study asking different generations of donors what their preferences were. And one thing that was interesting to me is that older donors, so donors in the baby boomer group, told me that they felt like they were being asked for money too frequently. Um, and they were getting all of those appeals through direct mail. But I heard exactly the opposite thing from Generation X millennial and Gen Z donors. They felt like they were not being asked for additional gifts. So what we found was that nonprofits were consistently sending out appeals through direct mail, but they weren't sending updates. So donors who were giving by direct mail never saw, oh wow, like I donated last quarter, look at all the cool stuff that they've done with that money, I'll give again this quarter. Instead, they just received appeals and it felt like it was too much for them. People who had responded to appeals on social media though, saw lots of updates, but they were never asked to give again. 
So what we can kind of deduce from that is that you can ask in different frequencies based on the channel you're using. If you're asking your baby boomer and your older direct mail donors for a donation every quarter but aren't sending updates, they're going to feel like you're asking too much. So try maybe asking them twice a year and sending them two updates. Alternatively, you can ask much more frequently through email and social media because you're, you're communicating more regularly there. So experiment and ask and see what works. Maybe send out uh, weekly Facebook appeals and send updates as frequently or more frequently and see what happens. And if you don't really notice a difference, go back to what you were doing. Have fun with it, just experiment. Yeah, I'd say our experience is the same and that it varies greatly depending on the channel. You know, yeah. Emailing someone once a week and asking them for to support your cause can be a lot. Mm -hmm. But asking more frequently on social media is much easier. Uh, you can really? also uh, do what we call like a soft ask on social media where you can tell mm -hmm. a story about some a successful campaign or maybe what last week's contributions help you accomplish. You have a learn more button instead of a donate more button or donate button. Yeah. And then when they go to read the rest of the story, there's a little soft ask at the bottom, like would you consider supporting us? And yeah. we frequently see you know, it's not a direct appeal, so you're not going to get a ton of donations, but we fr frequently see a lot of small donations come in that way as well. Yeah, my favorite organization has a link to their donation form and pretty much every link they or everything they post on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So they just wrapped up. It, <clears throat> it's a baby bear rehabilitation center, which is adorable. Um, they ran their peanut campaign. They needed to restock on peanuts for the bears. So they posted every day so this is so and so this is charlotte bear eating her peanuts like if you want to get in on this like donate here to buy more peanuts for charlotte it was adorable and it worked it's great perfect so, so we have another question sure. which is have you noticed zoom fatigue beginning to occur recently for virtual events so yes and no uh so what i will say is um the fatigue often seems to kick in when there isn't really a way for people to engage with you. Um, so one of the things that's hard about Zoom and when you're translating your traditional programming to Zoom is that your traditional programming often really relies on people being present. Uh, they're sitting and watching a keynote speaker. They're sitting and watching a presentation. They're sitting and watching um, a performer. But that is different when we're at home uh, and different when we have distractions and we can get up and walk away. And that does become kind of exhausting. So one way you can combat that fatigue is by trying to engage with people. Um, you'll notice uh, when I asked you all to type yes if you were experiencing a problem or type no if you weren't experiencing this problem at all, little things like that can really help. Um, I know I zone out in webinars all the time and I do them professionally, but people pay attention more when you ask them to talk to you and when you talk back to them. So if you are experiencing um, a dip in registrations because of Zoom fatigue, try working with smaller groups and engaging a little more and giving them the opportunity to talk back to you and, and make it a conversation, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons why we deliberately made these sessions a little shorter. Yeah. Uh, was to, uh, it's really hard to sit and just listen to a webinar, especially with all the distractions around you. Oh, yeah. Um, so keeping it short or no longer than necessary, interactions really helpful, trying to keep people engaged. So. Totally. So wonderful. Yeah. Another thing you can do is um, try, we've seen people do classes, like I mentioned that cocktail making class and a dance class. We've seen cooking classes go over really well. Uh, we've seen all kinds of fun classes and either if you wanted to get ambitious, you could provide your registrants the materials ahead of time or you can send them a list of materials they can get on their own. But something interactive like that where they're actually focusing on a task instead of just looking at a screen and occasionally getting distracted is much more effective. Awesome. So I, I think uh, we're about out of time. So uh, I want to thank Abby for joining us today from QGIV. Um, we'll be sending out an email with her slide deck for everyone, and then the recordings will be posted on the website 
I think the end of next week after the webinar series is finished. So thanks everyone. Have a great weekend and a Friday too. <laughs> and we'll see everyone next week. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.